Hi, Becky. Well, thank you. How long have you cut your machine? Um, for six months. Six months. Okay. So you used it, and you, you got to have more questions for me? Yep. Okay. And then I think we'll all learn from each other, and it will be really fun. Before you leave, there'll be no deer in the headlights looks. There'll be no <laughs> no questions left unanswered. It's my goal. Make sure you go home and get busy. Um, there is a folder on your chair, and there's a couple things in it. Um, you can take notes if you like, or you can just listen, and we'll make sure we get all your questions answered. Feel free to raise your hand during class so that you don't forget or keep a list. Uh, the first thing in your folder is a quick reference guide. Michelle can share with her. Uh, yeah, I can share with hers. Okay. Would yeah. you mind sharing folders? Sometimes couples will want to share folders. Cool. Uh, the first thing is a quick reference guide, and that will be a real quick, easy, at a glance um, overview of what each of the attachments is meant to do. So if you've got a project, you can use it. This way, if you've got a project, you can look on there and say, oh, it fits right in here with this brush. Or you can look at this brush and say, oh, it'll do that. It'll clean my upholstery. I can take it out to the car. There'll be a lot of things that that will help you with in the beginning. Um, the first page of our instruction manual is going to go over some basics of the machine itself. I think it's helpful if you have a name for the parts on the machine so that if there's something going wrong and you need to call and say, my cap is doing something. Let's first go through the, the name of the parts on the machine. We call, these buttons are the on and off button. And this is where the hose goes in. We call this the hose. This is the door for the hose. This is the pressure gauge. We'll talk more about everything, but first we'll just kind of name them. This is the green ready light. Green means go. And this is the light that tells you that you're out of water, the little water faucet light. This is the handle. Some people call this the handle, but make sure if you're talking about this handle versus this handle that you tell me which one's which. And this is the cap, the filler cap. On the back of the machine, we have the back door. And this is the compartment where your electrical cord stores. And we'll go over how to get that in there. So the back door versus the front door. And then the wheels and then the hose. That's about all the parts there are to the machine. Pretty simple little machine. And then on the hose we have the hose switches. And we'll go over what those switches do. And then um, that's pretty much all there is to a hose. <laughs> and then we'll go over each of the pieces of the machine um, as we use them. Um, page one talks about filling and draining water. Um, and you're welcome to use regular, ordinary tap water in your machine. Don't worry about buying distilled water. You're actually going to use the distilled vapor. All the minerals are going to sink to the bottom. And you'll want to use your filler bottle. These are pretty cool. They are spring-loaded, so they don't leak until you actually push on them. So you can get it from your faucet to your machine and you turn it upside down and it doesn't leak until you push on it. <laughs> so that water will go straight into the tank. It will go out and around um, where the electricity meets. There won't be, there's insulation around your tank. So you don't want to soak that. You want to put water inside your tank, not out and around. So you never want to just take it to the sink and kind of put it under the faucet and fill it or or use a hose, um, not a good idea. So if you lose your filler bottle, call and get it replaced because um, it will extend the life of your machine a long time if you keep the water where it belongs and not where it doesn't. Um, not a good mix, water and electricity. So um, that's filling, and you can fill it with about two and a half filler bottles. Well, it holds a little bit more than two quarts. This is a one quart bottle. So you can go ahead and fill it up and make sure that you've got plenty of time to clean on a full tank of water. Now let's say we've been cleaning for a while and we're finished for the day. Go ahead and shut your machine down, shut off both switches, and just put your machine away for the evening. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. The inside of the tank's been coated with um, a non-stick coating so it won't eat through it. It'll have um, no minerals building up on the inside. And, and you, you don't want to deal with the hot water um, when you're finished cleaning, it's about 300 degrees. So 
to drain it, not necessary, release any pressure, not really necessary. Just shut it down and put it away. And then the next time you go to use it, I recommend, now this is where we differ. There are um, a certain number of minerals that are going to collect in your tank with each tank full of water. So it's up to you how, how often you drain those. It's a really easy process. There's a drain plug right here. And to get that loosened, when you take your cap off, there's on the post of your cap, there's a little tool that fits right in there and acts as a wrench and takes that cap out. So take your machine to the sink and take that cap, that filler um, plug out, drain plug out, and let all the water that's left over from last time you cleaned drain into the sink. And you're going to see some little minerals from your tap water. And as long as they're white and there aren't too many of them, you're draining it about as often as you need to. If they are black, and there are so many of them that it's actually plugged up, that's not often enough. <laughs> it's kind of like your lint trap in your dryer. Some of us clean it out with every load, and some of us kind of let it build. Same thing happens. If you let the minerals build, it's going to cause your machine to work harder than it needs to. Or furnace filters. Some of us change those real regularly, and some of us wait a long time. So it's kind of a personality thing, but I will tell you there are a lot of minerals with each tank full, so my habit at least every five tanks full. Don't let it go too long. That's where we see problems. So um, there's no such thing as too often, and it is very easy. One thing about draining all the minerals out, you know your tank's completely empty, completely clean. And when you put your drain plug back in, you can fill it back up with two and a half bottles of water, and you can get started. You know you're going to clean for a couple of hours. So you may. Did you say you took the top and screw the bottom? Yes. The, the hand, the um, tap is a tool. I can't take this one no, off because it's it. hot, but I'll show you one that is cool. Let's look at her over time. And we'll go through that easily. <laughs> this comes out and you'll see a little tool on the bottom that's just the right shape for this. And then you'll loosen it. Loosen that and then twist out that hole. This one has a little water. If I let it out, it will drip. It'll leak water all over the floor. <laughs> so do this over your sink and when it's cool. Don't worry about if you've cleaned for a few hours and you've run out of water and you want to refill, don't worry about this drain plug. Only do this when it's cool because you get burned. Okay, another question. I, I've been waiting for the pressure. Okay, reheating can be very quick. You'll notice that when you're running out of water, two things will happen. The pressure gauge will drop and you'll see less pressure coming out. And then the, the light over here under the faucet will turn on and let you know that you're running out of water. When that happens, I just shut off the boiler tank. I leave the electricity tank, the, or electricity power switch on so that my hose still works. And I just bleed off the rest of the pressure. In fact, I just keep cleaning whatever project I was doing. I just keep going until I have no steam left. And then I shut my, my, my hose switches off. And I can take my cap off. You'll hear another little When you notice that your gauge is all the way at zero and there's no more steam coming, just take the cap off. And then you can refill with two more bottles and use cold water the next time. Cold water helps the thermostat shut all the way down, and then as it heats, it will heat all the way back up, and the thermostat will know exactly where it is. And when you're putting water into your hot, hot tank, sometimes it does that bubble boil like a radiator <laughs> thing. <laughs> so just use the tip of your um, filler bottle up here, and keep your hands and face away from the opening, because when that cold water hits that really hot tank, you're going to see some spitting and some, some water coming in and out. And then it takes about four or five minutes when you build it back up and turn your buttons back on to get you back up to where you need to be. And your little gauge will tell you that you're in the, you're in the zone and you have a green light and green means go. Now the green light is going to fluctuate. It's going to turn, watch it. It's going to turn off as soon as you turn on your switches. So I usually just watch for it to come on at the beginning of heat up and then I ignore it. You'll drive yourself nuts if you 
if you only clean when the green light's on. Because it's going to go off as soon as you turn this on. And that's normal. That says it should be. It's hooked to the thermostat. So your thermostat fluctuates as you're cleaning. Any other questions on filling and heating? So we know we don't need to use distilled. Tap water's fine. We're just going to clean those minerals out periodically. Okay. One day I heated my app without refilling it at all, just heating old water. It popped really loud. You're right. It's a cold water on a hot tank, and it's, it's like when um, you, you start to hear it crackle and pop as, it, as the water starts to build in the temperature. So that's kind of normal. It can be kind of scary, though. I bet you thought something was broken when that happened. The well, first I just did, uh, put it away one day, and then I knew I hadn't used it very long, so I just reheated it. I didn't put any more water in it or right. anything. And it really popped. popped. Yep. It was, it was loud. It's pretty loud, and you'll you'll actually sometimes see it shake. <laughs> but it's not a problem, and, and it is fine to reheat cold water as long as you're, especially if it's just a quick job. I just need to get something really quick. I don't need a full tank. It's fine to reheat yesterday. Julie, I was told that uh, you have to push your thumb down on the cap to get in it when it's hot. You can. If it's under pressure right now, it spins. This won't come off, and that's a good safety thing. You don't want that 50 pounds of pressure in 300 degrees. When you have run out of water and it's time to refill and the pressure's gone, you'll want to push in the center of that cap. It's kind of squishy. It feels like um, it feels like a little rubber gasket and push down and twist at the same time like a medicine bottle and then you'll be able to get that cap off with regular twist. So the caps have a safety valve in them. I'll let you feel that so that you get an idea of what we're talking about. If it's really stiff and you have a hard time with just your thumb, use your steam nozzle as leverage. Oh, that'll, that'll that's cool. Cool. I never thought of that. Some of us have strong thumbs, some of us have these funky fingernails, some of mm -hmm. us have arthritis, everyone's got something different, but um, just use your, use your tool to help with that. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, one other thing, while we're looking at the caps and the drain plugs, each of them have a gasket right around this um, post. And it's just a little rubber gasket that takes up any extra pressure so that it's not metal on metal when the heat builds. So as you're putting your caps on, Twist them on until they feel like they're catching, and then just about a quarter of a turn more. Not a big old crank it down really tight, because you'll just end up smashing these, these gaskets, both on the, the filler cap on the top and the drain plug on the bottom. There are the dead Did you? And you can replace the little gaskets, okay. it's not a problem, but it's easy to avoid having. What I'd like to do tonight is, is make sure that you don't waste any money. Knowing how to take care of your machine will keep you from unnecessary repairs and replacement. Anything can be fixed and we can replace these pieces, but should last a good long time if you if you just know how to put things together. How many of you bought an iron? Oh, good for you. Have you used it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ladies yeah. who didn't buy one, ladies who did buy one, any comments? <laughs> I love it. Love yeah. it. It's love my it. favorite part. I used to go to the dry cleaners all the time, and I seriously, I don't go to the dry cleaners anymore. It's, it's pretty or nice to go. Awesome. And it's been, I hear that a lot. We have a lot of folks, that's their favorite part. In fact, the husbands and wives fight over it. He wants to iron and she wants to clean. <laughs> I wish that was that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a mine, but I have heard about it. Okay, for the iron, um, and how many of you bought the attachment iron versus the standalone? Attachment. Attachment, okay. Then here's what you have, and you'll notice that the plugs for the iron and the plugs for the hose are exactly the same. So you'll just take your cleaning hose out and plug your iron hose in. And you'll hear it click, and that lets you know that you're in. As soon as you plug it in, you're going to see this gold light. That lets you know that you're heating, and your soap plate's going to be getting hot. So you'll want to have your iron rest nearby. And it doesn't really matter if you sit it on the rubber part or the bottom part. They're both pretty heat resistant. I like this one because it keeps my soap plate from sliding. And it's nice to have that just sitting on my ironing board. And then I can just sit that without you won't miss this thing where it used to sit up. Did you have an iron that used to sit up on its end? You'll really like not having that purple tunnel thing happen <laughs> because it's just going to be flat all the time. 
And so rather than scorching your ironing board, you'll want to use your iron rest. And then when you're finished ironing and you flip it over, it's got some little some little slots that it fits into so that when you put it away, it won't burn anything and it'll protect that from, from scratching. While we're looking at the bottom, you'll notice that the steam comes out the tip. And that's a really cool feature because as you're ironing, you'll introduce steam at the beginning of the tip of the iron and as you pass it along the garment, this whole hot sulfate has a chance to dry away all that steam. I think you'll find it's really fast because there's no moisture in it, and then as you reposition your garment from one place to another, it won't re-wrinkle. So I usually take one slow stroke up the garment with steam, and then pull it back, and get rid of all that steam, and, and get a nice crisp press. Buttons on the iron are, the dial is like you've seen with other irons, the fabric settings. The one difference is that you need to point it toward the back. This little post right here is actually where you're lining up, rather than some of them point to the nose. So this one is actually set to the maximum. And if you turn this fabric setting down, you're going to get a cooler sulfate. Sometimes you'll get a little spitting, a little moisture with a really cool sulfate. The hotter the sulfate, the drier the steam. So I find that on cottons and linens, things that, things that can withstand the heat, the hotter the better. So if you have to turn it down, um, you're questioning silk. Uh-huh. Okay. Hot iron for silk. I've melted it before. Melted the silk? Uh -huh. Okay. Everybody's got their own wardrobe, and you kind of know what, what's too much heat and what's not. It's a good idea. I always do my silk hanging up. I do my silks and rayons, things that are this fabric. If they just have a few hanger wrinkles, you can use those right on the hanger and do some steaming, vertical steaming. Wow. And that'll be really fast. You won't have to drag out your ironing board if it's the type that you put away. And that will kind of freshen the smell. If maybe last time you wore that, you were at a Chinese restaurant and it had that Chinese restaurant smell. <laughs> that can kind of, this hot steam can kind of help get rid of that. And then um, pull out the hanger wrinkle. Um, when you're ready to set a crease, you'll want to sit, sit it on a board. You'll need the hot sole plate for creases. But you should be able to get through a couple of layers at a time. That 50 pounds of pressure is really going to penetrate through all the steam, all the um, fabric layers, and you should get really great results really fast. And then setting the seat, you can put that back on the ironing board if that's what you're used to. Press over those. Or you can just kind of hold them up and steam them depending on the garment and the type of crease you like. So you should be able to get through a man's shirt, a dress shirt, in a couple minutes, a pair of trousers in slightly longer, and then you won't be transferring the seat marks to the back pocket. We have some, some pros-only ironing classes. Is anyone interested in learning how to be a better ironer. Talk to me after class, I'll give you the schedule. <laughs> Any questions at all about the iron now? Oh, one other thing on the buttons. For your attachments, you have um, you have two <coughs> settings. You have low on the side where your thumb is, medium on the top, and high on the side. So you can determine how much steam you're actually putting out by which button you push. This is pretty comfortable. I use full blast a lot. You're used to that one on the top probably, but again, be comfortable and, and you'll know how much steam you need for the garment that you're ironing when you get when you get it on your ironing board. And then when it's hot, make sure you leave it on your iron rest until it cools so that you don't scorch your ironing board. Um tell me this do excuse me, do you find that, that cord? It's long enough. I do, especially one thing I was going to ask is when you are ironing, how have you got your iron and your steamer set up? Are you leaving it in the cart? No. Are you putting it somewhere? My favorite for just a regular ironing board is to put the steamer base right here in, in the V. Mm -hmm. So that it's right in front of you. 
And then this court has plenty of room to reach either end of the ironing board without pulling on it, stretching it. You'll notice it gets hot because we put steam through it. It isn't certainly going to burn you, but it's definitely warm. So you've warmed up the plastic, you've warmed up the nylon, and it's possible to stretch it independently from the nylon outer wrappings. By, by that I mean, if you're stretching really far to the end of an ironing board because your machine is still in your cart and it's too far away from the end, it's possible to pull these things apart, especially when they're really hot. So my recommendation is where the steamer is there, and then you don't worry about that. You also don't rub the nylon across the edge as often as you do if it's sitting someplace inaccessible. You see sometimes after many years, this nylon tends to kind of break. It's cosmetic, it's not gonna hurt anything, but if it does start to pull away from either one of the connections, you'll wanna come in and have that looked at. But again, I think you can avoid it if you just place your steamer there. Um, if it's up on a counter, maybe you have a, an ironing board or a counter or your ironing board comes out of the wall, just kind of keep in mind how far your cord is reaching and what it's rubbing against as you're ironing. Everyone's setup will be a little bit different. Any questions on that one? You guys are good. <laughs> how many of you have a, your favorite ironing board? How many of you are in the market for a new one? <laughs> we sell one that will knock your socks off, I'll tell you. It is heated, so you're going to get heat from the bottom of the garment as well as the full plate from the iron. It's also got a suction device so that it pulls the steam that you're, you're using down into this motor rather than billowing up into your face and making you hot and making your hair fall. <laughs> and if you're um, pressing um, garments that have dry cleaning fluid in them or formaldehyde because they're new, you're going to be breathing that. So this is actually a healthier ironing board than, than the one you're probably using. Um, it's a very well-constructed board. Any of the holes here were cut first, powder coated second, so they won't rust. You won't get those brown spots that come up in, into your um, ironing pad. Um, and then you can wash this ironing pad if it gets dirty or if it needs, um, if it needs a good laundry. And it's adjustable, you can sit it down. Some folks like to sit and make it comfortable so that they're sitting and maybe watching a movie. Some of us who iron for a really long time need to be a little more ergonomical than others. And then this side over here will hold um, either your iron rest, if you're using your, your um, steamer base on the floor, or the independent iron has its own steam base and sits on the side here. And then you can hang things off the side as you're as you're getting your ironing done. It also has a plug so that you can plug your steamer or your iron into the board first and then plug the whole thing into the wall so you're not using too many plugs. I know sometimes in the laundry room you don't have too many plugs so, and they may be hidden. So to not have to reach around behind things, this extra um, electrical port can be really bad. Julie, I've had my machine just long enough to know this that they, what I ironing, my ironing board is rusting really badly. Is it? I think when these, these machines put out so much steam that you're really getting your pads soaked. So what you may want to do is have a couple of pads and change them out as they get really wet. Um, or um, join our referral program and earn enough referrals that you can buy your own new ironing board. That's good. <laughs> when someone wants something new, I like to talk about the referral program. How many of you bought because a friend recommended us? But about half of you. That's typical. About half our sales come from one happy owner telling her friends and neighbors about you've got to see this whole thing. So uh, we pay for that. Whenever that happens, both of you get some benefits. You get merchandise for being the referrer and you get then you get merchandise credits for being the referee. There is a couple of, um, there's a paper in your folder that explains the whole program. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it's really quite fun. It's gonna happen anyway, so you might as well get paid for it. <laughs> a friend's gonna come over and see your machine and say, what is that? And you'll show and they'll say, okay, I've gotta have one of those, where do I go? And you'll be able to give them your friends, don't let friends clean the hard way coupon and each of you can take the money. <coughs>
Now, what if I don't want to loan my friend my machine? Oh, please don't loan your friend your machine. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen friendships fail because invariably the borrower doesn't, for some reason, understand. They'll they'll drop it, they'll break it, they'll lose something. There's just a, you've been to class, you own it, you you learned how to maintain it, you know what you're doing, and somehow. The farther away from you your machine gets, the less people know of that. So we rent them. If someone oh. wants to borrow yours, refer them to us, and we'll rent them a machine. Um, we'll enter them in the referral program. You'll get credit for that if you okay. need, if they end up buying one. Um, it's it's not my recommendation to lend your machine. In fact, we have our owner says hers just doesn't date. <laughs> it's hers, and get your own, please. <laughs> Any other questions on the iron before we leave that? For those of you who don't iron or didn't, thank you for, for sitting with us. And um, if you're thinking about it, talk to me after class. We can, we can get you into a new iron. I am on page nine. I'm going to talk about the hose. I'm going to plug it back in. And we just want to lift the door and hear it click. If it's any harder than that, your angle is just off. Does that make sense? That needs mm -hmm. to go straight in. And if you're down on the floor and it's kind of inconvenient, um, make sure that the, the square part of the hose is going straight in and you'll hear that click. does a couple things. It controls the heat with distance. If we push both buttons forward, we're going to get a great blast of steam, which is going to clear out the hose of any leftover water. It's going to give us a good blast to get dust off of the plant from a distance. It's going to send all those dust bunnies out from under your refrigerator. <laughs> it's a good shot of, of pressure, and you want to use it in short bursts. Watch what happens to the pressure gauge when you use the full blast all the time. Eventually, it starts to drop. So I find that I use my on mine on medium more often than anything else. So medium is just the red one forward, and low is just the orange one forward. So both is high, right is medium, and left is low. Does that make sense? They're pretty easy. They just rock. They're either on or off, and it's instant <laughs> off, which I think you'll really like. Because if you get to work something where it's like, oh, I don't want to burn that, shutting it like you, <laughs> like your own <laughs> self, <laughs> shutting it off instantly and having no pressure is a really nice feature. Very safe. Um, with the hose, again, when we talked about the iron where it connects, anything that goes together can come apart. So when they get really hot, be sure you're not pulling them this way. You're not dragging your whole cart by the handle. It's just not a good best practice. If you do need to pull the cart, grab a hold of the cart or nudge it along with your, with your leg as you go so that you don't pull that connection apart. It can be fixed, but it's annoying and it's not covered under warranty because it's not a defect. It's just the way you're using it. So I want to make sure that any sort of user techniques I can help you learn tonight to keep your machine in really good shape. It's pretty durable. They don't tend to, to wear unless you misuse them. So be real careful with them. If you do need a new one, we can repair them or we can sell you a new one. Locking rings on the end are all the same. The, the, the red ring twists to the left to loose and right to tight. You know that lefty loosey right and tighty. So I usually pick it up and just flip it to the left and these notches will open up, and then any attachment has notches on the sides, push it in, and lock it. So it doesn't matter what you're putting in the end of there, everything works the same. And lock them in. I have forgotten to lock my ring and shot my nozzle clear across the room. <laughs> I know it happened, but that's a lot of pressure, so lock that off and then you're safe. I like that much better than then we have those push button, anything that attaches with a little button you have to push and 
lock it in just mm -hmm. right. And it, I didn't like that at all. The locking ring is really an easy mechanism for, for all of us. Now I mentioned that heat controls the, or the distance is control, controlling the heat for you out here. It's not very hot, but as you get closer, right at the tip, it's really hot. So if you have something that's not very heat resistant, do, do your steaming from a distance. If you have something that's very heat resistant, go ahead and touch it. And just remember that that's 300 degrees. It's going to melt right through this grease and grime that's on there. And, and that's exactly what you need. But if, if you've got something that's not very heat resistant, a wood varnish or painted walls, you want to make sure that you're not burning them. And then the pressure is, again, high, medium, or less. So my vote is anytime you have put on a brush and it's got a cloth wrapped around it, I don't see much point in high pressure because it's going to hit that cloth and there goes your pressure. So save yourself some water, <laughs> refilling, and keep your pressure nice and steady and use either the medium or the low whenever you have a cloth attached to your machine. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, extension one keeps you off of chairs, Michelle, mm -hmm. off of <laughs> toilets, Michelle, <laughs> <laughs> off of ladders, <laughs> off of your knees. None of us can afford to be down on our knees scrubbing anywhere. I don't care how old you are, what kind of shape you're in, there's just no point to it. So if I have tile grout down there on the floor, just build yourself a couple of extensions so that you can reach without bending or stooping or kneeling and get your job done very comfortably. Especially if you have a lot of tile. It can be a little bit time consuming to paint each grout line while you're detailing it, so make sure you're really comfortable. If you're really, really tall, you need two to three to reach the, the floor. If you're really, really <laughs> short, you need three to reach the ceiling. We recommend two to three. You can use up to four, but after that it gets a little bit unwieldy, and it also drops, your pressure drops quite a bit. The farther away from your your machine you are, the, the less pressure you have. So four at the most, and two is about average. Okay, let's work with your rectangle brush. Love this, because it covers so much square footage and it does everything from any type of flooring to the walls, if you need to do ceilings, your mattresses, um, even if you have a lot of countertops that you want to take care of pretty quickly, it just covers a lot of square footage at once. And it's very versatile because it can be a very um, scrubby, um, abrasive, scratchy bristle tool for textured linoleum, textured tile tops. If you've got something on the cement and you really want to use these bristles, then use it bare. And then if you don't want it to scratch, you have some options. You can either cover the bristles with the brush cover and then wrap them with towels, or you can just wrap with towels. But if you've got hardwood and you don't want to scratch through that warm um, varnish, then you want to make sure you cover up your bristles. And if you want it to be a one-step process where you're steaming and lifting the dirt at the same time, you'll cover your, your uh, brush with a cloth. So let's do the first way I like to do it with a white cloth and I like this when I'm doing carpeting um, anything that's going to get my cloth really dirty because you can you can launder these white cloths and bleach them and really let them be your little workhorses. I've got a hard time tucking that white cloth in. Mm -hmm. All right let's do that slower. <laughs> there are four clips on the top and so it's basically diapering your brush and I like to fold the cloths that we sell in about a third. That's that seems, what's wrong. That seems to fit best. Half makes it a little hard to That's why I didn't in. do it. It wasn't big enough. And it depends if you're using old bath towels. If what, it, what depends on what type of cloth you're using but this is about the size you want so that by the time you wrap it up and around the brush it will fit into the clips tightly. Like that. And don't worry about tucking the ends in because you're going to be getting this awful dirty and then you're going to be turning it over and using the clean side. 
So it doesn't need to be real perfectionist, just so that it stays put. Yes, so sure. you So you turn it over and use it more? I do. I like to use all the clean sides mm -hmm. before I launder it because there's only dirt right here. Anything that was tucked in can be refolded and put a new clean spot underneath. So that saves on laundry. <laughs> so I like to do, um, like I say, the dirtiest jobs. If I've got a carpet spot I need to work on, I like this. And again, medium pressure is probably fine. I do like to give myself a good blast and then back it off. And that way I know I'm well done. And you'll notice that I'm not putting an awful lot of elbow grease into this. You want to just glide along the top of the carpet. The more you push, the harder it is to actually make it move. So actually pulling toward you with no manual labor, <laughs> or as little manual labor as possible. You just let it glide across the top and penetrate, that seam will penetrate down into the carpet fibers. And as the heat rises, it's going to bring dirt up into your cloth. So... That's fine. Anytime you want to make it a one-step process, I'm going to just pick up what's dirty here. So I'm cleaning, I'm lifting, and removing the dirt in one step. The first time you do some of these really dirty surfaces, it might be better to take the cloth off, let those bristles really get in and loosen, and then throw a big towel down and pick it up. You know how you used to do that with your foot? Mm -hmm. Just throw a big towel down. And clean with the bristles. Let those do their job, loosening all that ground in dirt. Now we've loosened it, but it's still sitting there, right? So we want to pick it up before it dries and sinks back in again. So that's the two-step process. The next time you do that same flooring, wrap your cloth and make it one step. Yes, Michelle. Do you still call carpet cleaners? To come, or is this? Do you use this? To you know, it carpets? depends. If you have a whole house full of really dirty carpeting, a carpet cleaner could be faster. But if you have an allergy to the chemicals in the shampoo that they use, or the residue that it leaves behind, then don't call them anymore. And just do this on a regular basis. You'll vacuum, and then you'll steam. Same motion, same amount of time, and then you you'll find you won't have to call a carpet cleaner in. So. Does that really not answer your question at all? No, it <laughs> it's does. kind of up to you. Where I love it is traffic areas, spills as they happen, maybe a pet stain. You can keep up on your carpet and not have to call a professional in for a lot, lot you can extend that a lot longer in between. And then so many of our customers just find that the chemicals are harmful and they just don't want them around their pets and their kids. Anytime you put shampoo into something and you don't get it all back out, what's it going to do? Sit there and do its job of attracting more dirt. So I think you'll find that your carpets will stay cleaner longer if you move away from adding any sort of soap. Which steam, you can steam them with, with no soap at all, no shampoo. Now if we have hardwood, how many of you have hardwood floors at home? Okay, about half of you. I like to add a microfiber for a couple reasons. Um, it will let me have a, a one-step process that will clean and dry and shine and polish and buff all in one. What happens with this when it gets hot, it tends to stretch. So it's not a really tight clip. It kind of sits there. And then you wrap your claws around it. So it's entirely up to you whether you use it or not. It does add one more distribution of steam and lifts your bristles completely off. It tends to wiggle a little bit. That's what I noticed with mine. I wiggle a little bit. Yeah. But that's fine, right? Yeah. There. Wrap it tighter. Mm -hmm. Put your cloths in, your clips a little bit tighter, or, um, or leave it out. It really depends on your floorings. I don't find that it's there's, there are ways to lift your bristles up without it, but it's a good tool to have if you really want those bristles covered. Now while we've got this up here, this brush, this brush will swivel. So it's very nice when you are um, standing in one spot and you need to get underneath the little kick space under your cabinets. Look what I just did. Upside down. 
it, it will swivel, it will stay flat on the floor while you're moving underneath things. And then you can kind of stand comfortably and, and keep, keep the surface, keep the brush right on the surface without moving yourself. If you want to do, and it also keeps my bristles from poking through and doing any scratching. And there are eight steam jets in here, so if you don't have your brush dis distributing those evenly, you can get little eight little lines. So you want to make sure you cover that well. You can add this if you like. Lock that off. Line up these little notches. Can everyone see those little notches? There's one on the black part and the red part. Line them up and then flip this switch so that they don't swivel anymore. A couple reasons I would like that is if I were doing a ceiling and I wanted... Thank you. <laughs> Now here's one place I do like this upside down. If I have to do a ceiling, I like to put the, the hose right in my belly, use enough extensions to touch the ceiling, and just walk. <laughs> None of this up over your head thing. I don't know about you, but that makes my shoulders really tired. So just use the leverage of the machine itself. And then it won't, it won't swivel and be squirrely. It'll stay right on your ceiling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't like to clean ceilings myself, but <laughs> um, if you have a candle that, that goes wonky and you've got a black smudge or you know you just want to extend one more year before you repaint, sometimes washing the ceilings and the walls can, can keep you. If you have apartments, do any of you have rental units where people are moving in and out constantly? Joyce, you do. <laughs> you know, every time a renter moves out, there's either wash so every single solitary surface or repaint it. So this can save you some money before you have to redo paint. What it saves is this hard, hard, hard labor. Yeah. Well, and I think it's also nice that you don't have to touch somebody else's dirt. So you think you've got a <laughs> distance between you and stuff you're not quite sure what it is. <laughs> Any questions at all about that brush today? Remember anything? How many extensions can you put on there? You can use up to four. Again, any more than four, it starts to get a little bit unwieldy and you lose pressure. But if, if you need four to be comfortable, go ahead. We find three is about average. So we have two that come with the machine and then we recommend one more in your deluxe accessory kit. That's just kind of a general consensus from the staff. Pick. Yes, Chantal. Um, what about travertine? Travertine, so you've got grout lines and you've got little pits and textures. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like to do that in the one step process almost all the time. Just so that you've got those bristles in there, getting into all those textures and then throw the towel down and pick it up. Is it textury enough that it actually um, pulls the lint off of the white towels at your house? Yeah. Okay, so it, that tells me that it probably would be better for you if you did the two step process most of the time. Mm -hmm. Cleaning it with the bristles. And move slowly. None of this. That's just not as effective. Just move slowly. Let the feet penetrate. The steam blast it out. Actually, the slower you go, the better results you get. And then throw a, a towel down and pick up what you've loosened. And I think you'll find that that's good. Now, where is your travertine? Is it in your kitchen? Is it in your tub? In your shower? In my bathroom. In your bathroom. Sometimes we find that soap scum and and hard water kind of gets deposited in there. If you do need something to loosen the hard water, we've got some, some products that will help get through that because the steam's hot enough to melt through soap, shampoo, you know, makeup, anything in your bathroom like that, but the hard water is a mineral and it won't melt, so you need something to soften that first. We have a couple products. The Shirk, uh, Stain Shocker is um, the most mild, and that can be really helpful. It's salt and soda. Spray that on first and it'll start to soften that. And then when your bristles go across that, they'll abrade that away. If that's not enough, move to the that orange stuff. <laughs> orange and silica flower. Comes out like toothpaste. Just squirt a little on your bristles. And then go over your travertine and that should loosen it. That's pretty biodegradable. It's, it um, doesn't have any bleaching properties, doesn't have any lye. Pretty mild, but add steam to it, really effective. <laughs> and then if that still doesn't do it, we have something called tub and tile. And that's a sugar cane based product that's a little bit more intense. It works a little bit faster. Has a little bit more of a 
fragrance when you're cleaning. So again, if you're one of our customers who's really moved away from chemicals, then we'll help you get through it without. Okay, power pads. Power pads are an optional accessory. There is a page in your folders that will show you some of the accessories we offer. I don't know exactly what everyone bought, so what I'd like to do is just show you how to use everything. If, if you own it, then you'll know. If you don't, you may want to consider it. Um, and there's a page in your folder with a picture of pretty much everything we sell. As I go through these, if you don't have it and you'd like it, maybe circle it, and then after class, we'll will help you fill your order. That way, um, you won't have to turn your remember now. What was that thing I wanted? I think that will that will help you see how to put together anything that you may want to buy. Um, I didn't know that. I tried to put this little thing on that and just ruined it. I didn't realize that that stretched over those. It can stretch over anything you want. The square, the round, the big, the little. And they, they do stretch. It doesn't really ruin it. They'll just stretch back wherever you want them. But when I put it on that, I just put it. On the power pad holder. It, this, yeah, it can yeah, do a little bit more. It's up. pretty effective, though. What you may want to have is one that goes over the square one permanently for ovens and barbecues. You can get into the racks two at a time. I like the square for a lot of reasons. It'll cover the whole footage here because it's solid on the bottom rather than hollow. So, um, and then maybe have another scrub bud that you use other places that doesn't stretch and get all gummed up and greasy. I have a box of them on hand all the time. First I use them at the kitchen sink to do potatoes and carrots so that you just scrub rather than peel. And then when they get a little warm, then they go to the stove top, then they go to the oven, then they go to the barbecue, and like a year later, they go in the garbage. <laughs> they can go in the dishwasher, so if they do get gummed up, you can melt through that. You can even you know, steam all that gunk out. just depends on how long you want to make it last. A couple of the things are just a little bit um, disposable, and I'll show you, and, and kind of what we recommend. We, we have two of each color, so that once you wear through one, you still have another. And then you can just replace whatever colors you, you use most often. They get darker and more abrasive as they get darker. So the white one I like in the bathroom, if you have hairspray or toothpaste or makeup on the vanity or the mirror, this will gently abrade that away. It's kind of like, do you do any of you have soft scrub that you've used? Oh, yeah. Some sort of gritty mm -hmm. chemical? You can get rid of that and use steam and this. It's got the grit and then the heat has the the cleaning properties. It doesn't have any bleaching properties. It won't take a, a, a red dye out. It won't take spaghetti sauce out, but it will gently abrade away things that are stuck on. And then as they get darker, they get a little more abrasive. By the time they're black, that's really good for baked on things in the oven, um, barbecue if you've got paint overspray on cement. Those are really, really scratchy. They're nylon, so by nature, 300 degrees and a lot of scrubbing, they will disintegrate eventually. So uh, again, as you need to, you can just replace the ones you want. They come in the small square size to fit on the square disc. They come in the diamond shaped size to fit in the center of the diamond brush. And again, this can kind of lift the bristles up off the surface if you don't want them, don't want them scratching and cover it with a cloth. Or you can use it without and a really high-tech little piece of equipment to help keep it in there, a ponytail holder. <laughs> is, that, is that something that comes with the thing? Or yeah, we do have them here. You can get those at the grocery store. You can use a rubber band. Rubber band won't last very long, but they don't the last very long. The they're just my the one. But it helps keep that power pad in there. Alternately, you're always going to have a surface it's sitting against, so you could just let it sit there, and as you move along the shower wall, it will be fine. When you move it away, it will fall, but she's not thinking about the power pad. I'm it's sorry. It's right there. Oh, okay. She's saying can you buy those? Oh, yes. yes. You can buy those. These are extra. The bristles will, will do the abrading, and you can cover them with a cloth, so it's one of those things that we don't think is mandatory, but if you have a whole lot of marble shower enclosure or if you really want to scrub into the texture of your tile countertop I kind of like those so think about those if you need to. Where I found that incredibly helpful was when we had to move a bridge out in a rental 
uh, underneath the fridge was beyond filthy. How bad? Oh, that really, really helped. That was fast. And if you are using any sort of um, that orange paste, if you put a little in the center, it really disperses it nicely. Mm. So there's a couple places where those are pretty helpful. They also come in the shape to fit inside the, the uh, floor brush. Same reason, same applications, just a little bit more square footage. What kind of sink? Do we have wood porcelain sink? Stainless steel? Korean. Stainless. Wood Korean. Okay. Pretty much any kind of sink. I really like the power pads. It'll get that carbon markings. Do you have the aluminum cookware or, or cookware that leaves little black marks in your sink? Mm -hmm. I like the red or the blue to get those out. Once in a while, you'll get the color to transfer. It really just depends on what you're using. I've done this on the top of my white camp cooler and it's left a little blue shadow. I, it seems away, but you might use just white if it's a white surface so that you don't get the color transferring to your surface. Okay, page 14. The diamond brush. Let's start with it without the cloth. We have talked about it a little bit. Its bristles are in between. They're not quite as stiff and stretchy as the black ones on the bottom of the floor brush, but not quite as soft and gentle as the ones on the squeegee. They're in between. So it's nice if your surface is not quite as scratch resistant as um, stone or cement. And if it's not full, you've got all these little round jets coming out. So again, be aware of not leaving streaks on you know, your wallpaper or someplace where you don't want those jets. Cover those up and let them disperse really well. This has the same swivel as the floor brush. And so the same notches will line up and lock off if you don't want it to swivel. I don't mind if it swivels if I'm using it on a horizontal surface. But when you're using it on a vertical surface and you go along and it flips back at you, it will steam you right in the face. So <laughs> if you're up <laughs> on a wall, be sure to lock that off to be safe. It also swivels on the head, which is really cool because now I can add some extensions, cover it with a cloth, and I can just walk along the floor and do all my baseboards. Or up high and do all the crown moldings. It'll stay right, mm -hmm. smooth, and easy. So if it needs to be corner and get into corners, you've got that. If it needs to be solid along the top, you have that. It's a little bit more difficult when it's wrapped. Can't go too far. This is just like a shower cap. Just point the pointy, put the pointy end in first and then wrap the edges around. I don't typically worry about locking them in when I have my elastic cloth because the elastic holds pretty well. But that one's going to be in there nicely. And then if you just have flat cloths, you want to put your microfiber on here to do um, stainless steel. You can just plant it in the middle and bring edges in until they stay. There's no real science to this. <laughs> just get it on there. Again, by the time it falls completely off, it's going to be dirty and ready to be changed anyway. So I like those clips if your cloths are flat. Go ahead and use old bath towels, old um, washcloths, anything that fits on this is really just fine with those clips. They'll, they'll keep it in pretty tight. Any questions about how it actually works? Lots and lots of applications. There is a, a nice long list in your um, workbook and also on your quick reference guide, places to use this. Now keep in mind, if it's bristles are bare, it's going to be a two-step process, cleaning and wiping, and then once you've wrapped it, there'll be a one-step process. How many have shower curtains and how many have shower doors? Curtains. 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 Doors. About half and half. Yeah. <laughs> and that's fine, too. Um, I like to have my cloth on my shower curtain and just um, go over all the folds so that, do you ever get that orange mold that kind of collects in those? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, you can buy them at the dollar store and just replace them all the time. Or you can just go over them with um, a cloth covered diamond brush and keep that mold from getting out of hand. Um, mold in the bathroom, you're going to love this steamer for that because it just kills it on contact. 
and you don't need any chemicals, and then it doesn't go from that orange to black to, okay, now I have to replace the caulking and the gravel. So keeping up on that is going to be a lot easier than replacing. Yes, Michelle? It was interesting. I did a house cleaning job on a Saturday, and the fellow that hired me didn't even go work. He stood there. It was amazing. <laughs> 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 fun, yeah. it? Yeah. If we had told you three weeks ago you were going to have fun cleaning, would you believe us? <laughs> mm -hmm. It can be. When you can see, when you can stand back and get it done and not have to work that hard, I think that's fun. I, I like it clean. I don't particularly like too clean, but I like <laughs> to have it clean. <laughs>
Initially, if it's got a lot of hard water and soap scum and shampoo and conditioner built up, this probably won't take it off the first time, so don't get frustrated. Remember we talked about um, stain shocker and that orange stuff and then tub and tile, progressively more, mm -hmm. um, more intense. Work your way through those products before you say it doesn't work. It really will, but again, hard water is a mineral, and this is just not hard enough to melt through that. Microfiber cloth. How many of you have used microfiber cloth before? Almost everyone. Okay, good. These are amazing. They have no lint. So terry cloth is going to leave some lint behind, but these are not. These are not going to leave anything behind. No moisture, no dust, no germs even. They're made of little tiny um, polyamide fibers that are shaped kind of like this. And they're like little teeny squeegees that just take absolutely everything with them. So I'll kind of show you. If I have a lot of moisture and I use a terry towel to get rid of it, I'm going to take some moisture with me, but I'm still going to have some left. If I use a microfiber, I'm going to get way more. If I use a glass cloth, I'm going to get even more. So we have different weaves in our microfibers. And these are my these are my little workhorses. I like them over my floor brush when I'm doing hardwood. I like them to be at my kitchen counter and wipe off after you've prepared dinner. Um, they just go everywhere and they pick up a lot of moisture and a lot of dust. This one's my finish polish cloth. Any place you used to have, okay, your last wipe, whatever that was. Some of us have used a sponge, some of us have used just a cotton dish towel, whatever that was, do yourself a favor and replace it with a microfiber. So that after you've done your teeth brushing and face washing, you just wipe off the moisture off your chrome faucet and there's never any hard water buildup, no germs. It just looks so nice, and then you just don't spend all this time undoing because you've kept up on it. Same with your stainless steel. If you use steam and microfiber, you'll never get that gummy buildup on your stainless steel that you do if you use the spray-on um, cleaners that kind of build, and then you don't leave fingerprints. So microfibers can be, you know, down and dirty and get dirty. They can be bleached. So. I tell my husband, please do not wipe up spaghetti sauce with this one. <laughs> it's my best cloth. And then, and your eyeglasses and your computer.